review some aspects of uh, the criminal justice system. And, um, oh, yeah, I mean, in this slide is not going to be new to any of you, but in this slide, I really just want to remind you about the circuitry between um, structures important for reward, like the nucleus accumbens and uh, the ventral tegmental area that projects to the nucleus accumbens, and also areas such as the amygdala, which are important for regulating a variety of emotions, but in particular, uh, fear and uh, inhibition of action. And there, of course, is the septum and uh, the hypothalamus. And so there's this really, really dense connectivity between these areas. And what would be important, and of course some researchers are working on this, would be to understand it in much greater detail. Now, in thinking about, I'll come back to the MAOA mutants. Uh, no, actually, I'll tell you about them right now. And I'm just going to give you the very fast story. I mean, a lot of this, as you can tell, I'm going skating over very fast. So a number of years ago, uh, Terry Moffat and her group in New Zealand asked a very interesting question. And the question was that there seems to be in the male population a certain percentage of male children that tend to be very, that have, as we might say now, conduct disorders, are sort of aggressive towards other children, get into fights, cause trouble, and then end up as juvenile delinquents later in the criminal justice system and so forth. What might be going on? So they had this really huge study, and they followed infants through development until um, sort of their, I guess, early 30s. Now, what they did find was that there was indeed a subpopulation um, who showed these character traits. But in addition, by the time that the years had rolled by, they were also in a position to do the genetic studies. And what they discovered was that a subset of this population had a mutation. And it was a mutation for an enzyme in the serotonin system, monoamine oxidase A. So the prediction was really quite high, that if you carried that mutation that affects the serotonin system, affects the quantity of serotonin that's around, uh, that you were going to show violent behavior. But there was an additional part of the result which was even more interesting. And I, you know, one would just die to know the, the, the mechanism and circuitry part of the story, but it's this. If you carry the mutation and you're abused as a child, the probability of violent behavior goes way up. Very interesting result. And of course, part of what you'd like to know if, you know, there, by the way, it's carried on the Y chromosome. So that's why you see it more in males than in females. But almost certainly there are some females uh, who have it on both X chromosomes, but it's likely to be a very small population. So how do we think about somebody like that, right? I mean, so I asked myself that, and I went, I was at the winter brain meeting, and I was going to talk about this and say, you know, should these people be held responsible? I mean, they're dreadful. So there is no question but that there's a public safety issue, but are they responsible for their behavior? So I was, oh, so it was fairly late, and so I thought, well, I'll just watch Law and Order before I go to bed, and it was an MAOA mutant story. <laughs> and so, yeah, sure enough, the guy was an MAOA mutant, and sure enough, he was abused as a child. So the story is that, you know, he's killed somebody, and they're going to plea uh, that he uh, should not, that he should be, um, not guilty by reason of insanity, given that he's an MAOA mutant. I thought, fascinating, how are they going to handle this? Now, some of you may have heard this story before, but it is really, really dumb. <laughs> they had him get into a fight in prison, and he got killed. Right? <laughs> so we never knew what the judge would say, or what the jury would say. And I thought afterwards, you know, I thought, well, that's pretty disappointing. I really wanted to know what law and order would think about this. but. <laughs> It's a very tough case, and that's why they punted, of course, is, um, 
you know, if you had a son or a brother in that condition, be very tough. All right. So um, let me, in thinking about uh, issues of, of control, just remind ourselves of the modulatory systems that play a really, really important role in reward. And reward is increasingly going to be part of the story. It can't just be that, you know, I recognize that I have to give up that Twinkie because I have a strong will. It's that my reward system has been tuned up in such a way that I'm able to conjure up this image of the Twinkie and my rump getting fatter and that causes inhibition of certain circuits and I walk away, okay? That's got to be something like roughly what's going on. So we need to understand much more about reward circuitry, which is the dopamine system. But of course, that's not the only thing that dopamine does about the serotonin system. But the other non-specific systems that arise uh, from brainstem nuclei. But it's important, too, to remember that these non-specific systems have these extraordinary properties. They're not carrying specific information in the way that glutamate mediated responses do. They modulate, they upregulate, they downregulate, but they're absolutely critical. And here, of course, you see the nuclei within the brain stem from which the serotonin projections arise, and then they project in this very, very broad way uh, all over the brain. But notice in particular that these sorts of regions, right, medial, frontal, orbital, all these frontal regions are very heavily involved, are very heavily serviced, perhaps I should say, uh, by the serotonin system. So in thinking along these lines, one of the uh, sort of conceptual tools that I helped myself to is the idea that if we don't want to think about free will in the folk psychological way, and we want to begin to think about self-control in a more neurobiological, in terms of neurobiological mechanism, we might want to sort of conceive of it in terms of a parameter space. And what I've provided here is really quite crappy, but it, will, it conveys what I think is potentially a, a useful tool. And that is this, that I, of course, am only showing three parameters here. I'm showing, say, levels of serotonin, amygdala frontal connectivity, what is disrupted, for example, in uh, the patients that the, the Damasios have studied, dopamine levels, but there will be many, many other parameters as well, including parameters reflecting um, the hormones, reflecting factors like uh, corticotropin releasing factor, which regulates anxiety levels. But the basic idea, and since you can only see three here, it's possible to visualize what I mean, is that there is a kind of rough, boundaried volume within this space within which you can be in control, in the sense that you can make decisions that by and large serve your interest and the interests of your genes. And that uh, if, for example, dopamine levels drop, you might sort of wander out of that space. Uh, but there are many different ways then of being in control, down here or down here, just as there are going to be a variety of ways of being out of control. I mean, the clear cut, it seems like social factors, I mean, different societies might define that boundary a little bit differently. I think that's right. Uh, that her point is that different societies might actually define this in, in a somewhat different way. And, and I think that that's a really important observation. Um, and it's an observation that suggests that some of this work is going to be quite complicated. Um, Guy Claxton makes the point that in Western societies we often and this might actually speak to your point too, we often identify ourselves in terms of our goals, our desires, and uh, our preferences. 